All righty. Welcome everybody to this afternoon's session of Linux Confeu. Our next speaker is Emily Dunham, who is telling us why we should speak. Exactly. Please make her feel welcome. Thank you. It's great to be back in Australia again for Linux Confeu. Uh, to start this off, I would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. So, oh, thank you. So just out of my curiosity, I would like you to think about your answers to these questions since I will come back to what the audience feels like about speakers as we talk about what it might be like for you to give a talk. So now that you're here in this room for me to talk to you, what do you think you're going to hear about today? Just think about that and think about where you got the idea of what you think I'm going to talk about. We'll come back to that. So who here has never spoken at an event and just doesn't ever want to? No hands? Fantastic. Who here has never spoken at an event but you think you might like to sometime? Cool, a few people, half a dozen. Who here has never spoken at an event but you've tried to get into them and just haven't quite gotten in yet? Nobody in that bucket. And so the rest of you, I assume, have spoken at some event who has, wow, that's a lot of the audience. I hope you will all learn something new from this, whether that's the general outline of what it would be like and how to go to a tech conference or some specific tips for presenting. So back to how the audience feels about the speaker. Does anybody here actually want to see me like totally crash and burn and fail on this one? Oh yeah, one, one snarky hand, okay. Um, I am ready to happily disappoint the one snarky audience member, but in general people don't. And you probably wa either want to see me succeed or want me to get on with the talk. So with that, we're going to talk about why you should speak and then a whole bunch of how you would go about it if you decided that you wanted to present a talk, including especially finding a topic and finding the right conference and working around the constraints that you might have. I'm personally a DevOps engineer by trade of many hats for many projects within Mozilla Research for the past three years. In the past four years, I realized, so I have a bit of a speaking problem. I've given 48 talks at 34 <laughs> different events, so I know many things about um, how to get into talks, and I've gotten rejected from, I've lost count of how many more talks and how many more events. So if you want to see what I've been doing when, you can check out that page. But to get on with it, why should you speak? Because it has a lot of benefits. You get to meet fantastic new people. You get to prove yourself as an expert in some little part of the field. You get to define what part of the field you're an expert in. So when you draw that line about around what you're going to talk about, you pick the stuff that you're already good at, and then you sound super smart. And if there's something that annoys you about the communities you interact with, something you want them to change, you can ask them to change it, and they very well might. For an, in, for an example of that, I gave a talk three years ago at an LCA about how Rust is automating its community management, and among other things, the importance of codes of conduct for having easy community management. And, it was and an awesome talk. thank you. Um, and Benno here took what he learned in that talk and took it back to the FreeBSD community and gave a talk the ensuing year about what he learned trying to apply it. So, if you think that just suggesting people do something is just shouting into a void. You, if you suggest that somebody do something um, without much of a platform you're speaking from, it might be, but if you suggest at a big conference to a large group, they will very likely try to put your advice into practice. It also helps your company if you're talking about something work-related, or even if you just mention where, they, where you work, because it makes them sound pretty cool to hire someone who's a local expert in this highly specialized thing that they're talking about. And if you say it's a great place to work, it helps them with their recruitment. Speakers are also essential to the conference. The more speakers, the more talk submissions a conference gets, the better a schedule they can put together. Um, as Rusty, I hear Rusty quoted as saying, um, you need a venue, you need speakers, and you need delegates to make an LCA. If you have those things, it's going to be great, no matter whether the venue is just a park somewhere. So if speaking at conferences is so great, why doesn't everybody do it? There are a lot of excuses. 
The first really good excuse is actually money. It's expensive to travel. It may be expensive to take time off work if you need to take time off. Some ways of working around this can be seeking out local conferences so you don't have to travel and don't have to take time off. You can consider weekend conferences if that's the way you want to spend your time. You can look for scholarships to a conference, especially if you're in some kind of minority. And you can look for sponsorships, especially if your talk is really in demand for that conference. You can ask and get help with money for speaking at conferences. Sometimes some people will have a contract that limits what of their work they can talk about. The best way to deal with this is to understand it carefully and negotiate if you can at the beginning um, of the contract before you've signed it. But once you've signed, you can carefully choose topics to work around it. And worst comes to worst, you can always just ask, is there any part of this work that it would be okay for me to talk about? I mean, worst case, they say, nope, none of it, and you're back where you started. So, Another big reason that people don't speak, probably the two biggest reasons, are fear and time. And if you're afraid of speaking, I think you need to ask, what do you really want to do? If you really just want to not, that's okay. You can still be an excellent technologist. But if you kind of want to and you kind of wish you weren't scared, you can work on that. You can get help with that. Um, and you can learn general public speaking skills from other places. If it's a brain chemistry thing, there are experts that can help you with that, and so forth. Conferences are structured so that you are extremely unlikely to ever get up and give a disappointing talk that just makes the audience really unhappy. How do they do that? Well, first, you write an abstract that promises what you'll deliver. And then the selection committee looks at that abstract and goes, do I or do I not think that this would interest some of my conference's audience? So if you're at a conference with a talk that just doesn't interest any of the audience, that's not your fault. That's the selection committee's fault, as long as you deliver on your abstract. And if you, and then you'll be in a slot with several other speakers against you. Like this slot has some fantastic talks that I would absolutely be in if I weren't speaking right now. And in that case, people choose which of those abstracts sounds the most interesting to them. So someone who'd rather be in another room, they'll be in that other room. They might watch your talk later online, um, but the audience is here because they want to be, because they want to hear what you have to say. And the people who don't want to hear it aren't going to be listening to you. So it's really structured to avoid boring or disappointing the audience just so long as you present the thing you promised you would. Um, Another subset of fear is, oh, I don't think I have any ideas. I'll talk in great depth about where you get ideas for giving a conference talk, but basically, ask people. Think about what you do and ask the people you talk to, what do you think I should speak on? So the time thing is a really thorny problem because doing a talk at a conference does take quite a bit of time to prepare and travel to the conference and present it well. Your time is your own. If you don't think it's a good use of your time to get the benefits of speaking, then don't do it, and that's fine. But if you would like to speak, and it's the claims that others lay upon your time, like the claims that your employer lays upon your time, possibly even that family members do, um, talk to those people about how you giving a talk would benefit them. Maybe it gives your employer some great publicity if you go up there and talk about your open source project you're doing at work. Maybe it gets your, um, your family members an excuse to come on a fantastic vacation to a different country if they accompany you to a conference. Um, think about who is claiming your time and how your speaking can help them. So I hope that this talk and that section will help you turn I can't speak into I'm going to choose whether or not to speak because of these trade-offs. So the other big part that I'm going to address for the rest of this talk is, OK, I'd kind of like to give a talk. What the heck do I do? First, you find a place that you could speak at. There are many places you could speak at. You could speak at your company. You could speak at any gathering that would be interested in a topic that you could speak on. But I'm going to focus on tech conferences here. So the first thing you do when you're looking for a place to speak is not to write your talk. It's to get into a conference so that you'll have a chance to present the talk at all. So the first step to getting into a conference is to getting some idea of what you would like to talk about. And you can have many ideas in flight at the same time if you're working on several different projects or if you can present one project from several different directions. I've got a big old checklist for you of ways that you can get ideas. Basically, what 
do you think people need to hear for whatever reason? Or what is it just really hard to get you to shut up about because you think it's fantastic? The intersection talks, the what you can apply from this other hobby or this other field I'm in that most techies don't know about to this thing that the techies care about can be excellent and can be given by somebody with minimal background in the actual technologies. So a few free topics for you. Please stop claiming that you don't have any topics. Fill in these blanks with anything that you spend your time on and then look for a conference that's applicable to that thing. Um, when you're picking a topic, you might also consider whether or not you want to speak with someone else. There's some trade-offs both ways there. On the one hand, being up on stage with somebody else can give you double the amount of question answering power and double the expertise. But on the other hand, working with someone else and practicing your talk and preparing a talk is a lot more work than just working with yourself. So I personally very rarely co-present, but that might be a style that works great for you. So about finding those conferences once you've got some topic ideas. Um, conferences are generally an annual thing. They'll come around each year and they'll ask for submissions at about the same time each year. You'll often find out about a good CFP by finding out that you just missed it. So what you do then is you put it on your calendar for next year. And my favorite way of finding new conferences that I hadn't heard about before is actually to follow speakers that really inspire me by either the way they speak or the tech that they're speaking about and look at their resumes, look at what conferences they're speaking at and get my ideas there. So also Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo are all your friend. You can search like Pearl Conference Sydney or Django Conference Portland or something, or Linux, free and open source software, technology conference, even a maker fair could potentially be a platform for you to share your ideas. So once you've narrowed down some conferences that you think you might want to present at, you gotta kinda research each one. Figure out who they're trying to get to attend the conference so that you can answer what value do I deliver for those people. See if you need speaker com compensation, if they offer you that. Um, and then the rules, the code of conduct and its enforcement can be a big one for some speakers. To what extent do you want that conference's organizers to take full responsibility for the actions of everyone there? And have they been able to do that in the past? Um, and then you're going to want to basically I shouldn't say stock, but um, you're going to want to get to know the preferences of your selection committee. And that starts by researching the conference's previous year's talks, what has gotten in. Because looking at the abstracts and the talks that have gotten into that conference based on the conference's annual theme in prior years will tell you a lot about the priorities of the people who will be looking at your abstract and trying to decide whether or not you're a good fit. Figure out basically what they seem to be looking for in that conference and try to offer them that. So now you've found a conference, you've found a topic, you've got some ideas about your selection committee. It's time to write the abstract that you'll sell your um, talk with and that will promise what you'll deliver when you're on the stage. You can um, basically tell your story somehow. There are lots of different ways to do that and get the people who will enjoy your talk into the room with it. You can write a bio about yourself. My main takeaway from bios is that it doesn't have to tell them anything about you that you don't want it to. And then apply to a bunch of conferences. Tweak your abstract, tweak your bio a little to specialize to each conference. You just go to the CFP website, the Call for Proposals website, and you paste your title and your bio and your abstract and maybe a little blurb saying, yeah, I think your conference is great. Here's why I'm qualified to give this talk. And you hit submit and then you wait and then you get rejected. I don't think there is any speaker here or any speaker at pretty much any tech conference unless they're incredibly lucky who hasn't got rejected a whole bunch for every talk that gets in. Um, if you think it's personal, you should try being on a papers committee sometime. They are so flooded with papers, they don't have time to take personal offense to any particular speaker. They, they are trying to build up this cohesive program out of a bunch of incoherent, unrelated ideas. And so often a really good talk won't make it into the program, not for any problem with the talk, but just because it doesn't fit in right with what the other people were submitting. So, Let's say you get lucky and you get into the conference. What happens then? 
First, you write a talk. And to write the talk, you gather a bunch of content. Gather the content that was in your head through whatever technique helps you turn a cloud of ideas into something more structured. I'm personally a note cards person, but you probably have your own technologies for that. And if you promised that you would have done some research, do that research now and throw it in with your um, other content and make sure that you hang on to the citations for anything that you're quoting, anything that you're drawing from. This is also a fantastic time to interview your expert mentors. Imagine that you're giving the talk and everyone who knows more about the subject than you do is sitting in the room and then they're going to ask you hard questions. You can anticipate those hard questions by asking them about the topic as you're planning your talk and incorporating their answers into the things that you cite and draw from. So then you put your ideas together in a way that sounds a bit like a story. This might be easy. It might be something that has a beginning, middle, and end, like how to give a talk. There's before the talk, during the talk, after the talk. Or it might be something super complicated. And you are always permitted to throw out ideas that don't fit. Just as long as it's not a core idea that you promised in your abstract, if an idea won't fit in, if it's going to really ruin your flow, just leave it out. Blog about it later. Now, if you're doing a tutorial on something, you will find that there are circular dependencies in what you need to know to understand a topic. You can't do A without B, but you can't do B without A. And my best trick for dealing with those and teaching through them is the, please trust me, we'll come back to this later. And then do come back to it later for them, but you have to break those cycles somewhere. Um, and at this point, once you've got your content together, you've got it in a rough outline that tells a story, look back at your abstract. See what you promised you would do and say. Did you promise them a story? Did you promise them an answer? Make sure it's in there. Whoops. And here is a slightly jarring transition that's going to feel weird in the talk because it doesn't flow right. When you're telling a story, you need to make sure that ideas flow from one to another. It feels a bit more conversational that way. Like when you're talking to someone and the ideas just kind of go together, it's like having a conversation with yourself. And it explains why you're saying each thing at each point in time. So another thing to examine once you think you've got your outline about right is making sure you have enough repetition for people to actually remember the really important bits. I like to pick the top three points and make sure that I've taught each of them uh, three or more times. So it should be pretty clear what my top three points are by the things that I keep repeating. And I hope that those are the things that you walk away thinking, if I want to give a great talk, I'm going to have to do those. So you've got your talk pretty well outlined. Some of this was on paper. Some of this was in your head. And it's time to make some slides to present to someone, uh, to present at the conference. So there's basically two camps for slides and a big old spectrum in between. There's the text slides, like I'm using today, which have their perks. You can hand the slides to someone and they can understand your talk, but they can get really boring. And there's this temptation to read someone the story, which will really put people to sleep. Conversely, there's the, I'm just going to show you pictures for the whole talk and talk over those pictures. It can be really powerful, but you're going to have to write your notes out or write your blog or something or force people to listen to your whole hour of talk if they want to get the value from your content. You can't just hand them the slides and they'll understand. And there's a risk with picture slides that you've really got to cite your sources and make sure you get those sources in there, if, especially if you're making sure to use um, properly licensed images. So what do you actually build slides in? Pretty much whatever you want. How do you know which of these things to build the slides in? You try a bunch of them and see what you like. Um, you, there, there's some considerations for how I think it's important to get slides to be, but your considerations might vary. I personally think it's essential that my slides are rendered from a text-based format so I can meaningfully keep that in version control. Because version control not only lets me back the slides up in case something bad happens to my laptop, but it also lets me um, travel back in time if I need to undo a change. And when you're um, when you're creating slides, think about how you will share them with other people if it's necessary to share them, especially if you've got text-heavy ones. License them in a way that's compatible with things. Um, archive them somewhere. And one of my favorite tricks is to publish the slides online before I give my presentation 
and stick the URL for the slides in the slide. So anyone who takes a photo, tweets it or whatever, can then find the rest of the slides. Relatedly, it's convenient to put a Twitter handle in your slides if you would like people to tag you when they're sharing your content. So some ways to go wrong with slides and how not to. First off, don't require the network for anything if you possibly can. Oh, good morning. I wonder what that's um, doing. Okay, don't require the network for anything if you possibly can. Try not to be too distracting. Try not to rely on audio if you possibly can avoid it. If you must rely on audio, work with your wonderful AV team um, well in advance to make sure everything will work. And generally, don't put things on your slides that you wouldn't want to show to your boss or that you wouldn't want to show to the boss that you hope you will have someday in your perfect job if your current boss is kind of um, a character. So also, there's, you'll hear speakers talk about taunting the demo gods. It's not some weird religion. It's just a recognition of the pattern that if you try to do a live demonstration while up on stage, everything that can break will. So at the end, I'll share with you some resources for, among other things, pre-recording any live demos so that you can show them as video clips rather than having to have them break in front of the audience. And always be prepared to just fall back to something else if your demo falls over. So when making slides, also try and make them accessible. Try and keep good contrast. Try and keep good font size. Don't go like blinky lights that'll give somebody a seizure and be aware that people with attention difficulties will find constantly moving things super distracting. Try to get your slides portable. The goal is you should be able to present from any computer that can talk to the projector because there's no guarantee that your computer will be able to talk to it. And when you're presenting, try to keep it accessible for people who have all kinds of different relationships with language. Some people will do a lot better with written words. Other people will do a lot better with spoken words. And so by having a certain amount of redundancy, you can cater to both groups. So you've got some slides. Time to rehearse your presentation with that presentation you've written. Because taking it from what's basically a glorified blog post to what's basically a performance will take a lot of practice. The first thing to do when rehearsing your presentation is to plan the timing that each section is going to take. How long have they given you? In my case, 45 minutes. How much time should each section have? In this case, I've got eight major sections there. It looks like there's nine, but there's really eight I care about. And I want five minutes for questions at the end. So they're like eight mini lightning talks of five minutes a piece. And Taking questions is strictly optional. You can end with, take your questions to this IRC channel, this mailing list, my email, my Twitter, whatever it is. You don't have to answer questions live on stage. Um, questions during the presentation as well can really throw off your timing. So be cautious with those unless you have slightly less rehearsed content than your slot and you'd like to pad it out a bit. So you've got your timing. You've got your slides. Record yourself trying to present them. And then listen to that recording. It is the worst, most uncomfortable thing. I have to wait a couple weeks before I can even listen to my own recordings of talks that go up on YouTube the next day without kind of cringing at the sound of my own voice. But if you listen to your own recording, you will hear every verbal tick, every awkward transition. And while you're listening, take notes about what you want to change, then go through and put those notes into your slides. A couple go rounds of that will get your presentation extremely well polished, especially for your first few ones where you don't necessarily have the speaking habits already established. And remember, you don't have to be talking for every minute of the presentation. <laughs> Yeah, you can make a joke out of it if you need a drink of water. It's, it'll be OK. The audience isn't going to leave if you pause for a minute to gather your thoughts. So you've recorded your talk. You've written down what changes you need to make. Make those changes. If you're having um, flow and transition problems as you go from one idea to another, put those in your speaker notes. If you really can't smoothly get from one topic to the next, reorder them if you need to. And make sure that you time yourself and get your timing as something that will fit in the slot. And then, 
Once you think you're doing great, you think you're ready to go, run it for another human and they will tell you otherwise. Um, I advocate for both rehearsing for a friend who'll tell you the like personal stuff, like, hey, when you turn around to point at the screen, you're doing that in a really funny way and it looks weird. And rehearse for an expert who'll tell you the technical stuff, like the way you explain that, that makes it sound completely incorrect. And then add those changes into your presentation. So I advocate for feature freezing your slides at two rehearsals before you present. What happens if you change your slides immediately before you present? All of those transitions between topics, all of that flow, all of that story that you memorized is going to hit a huge road bump where the slide you expected next isn't there. And if you find something that's a little bit wrong, needs a little bit of improvement after your feature freeze, it's easier to memorize how to route around that than to completely relearn a new order. And it lets you catch any errors that your slides might have had in them. So for your first few talks, before you're used to being on stage, it's essential to practice every aspect of how you'll be on stage. What will you be wearing? Are you planning on having a big piece of jewelry that might fling around and get in the way? Um, get used to talking with a screen behind you or reading off of your laptop screen and yet making eye contact with your audience. Um, speak to your pet, your kid, your friend, your rubber duck if you need to. And if you have medications, if you use caffeine, if, as I wouldn't recommend, you're going to have a little alcohol before your presentation, do your rehearsal with the modified chemistry that you're planning on having. If, you, if you're like, oh, I'll just drink four espressos right before my talk so I have enough energy, and you didn't practice like that, you're going to talk way too fast, get done way too soon, and have this kind of awkward pause at the end. So, Rehearse as realistically as you can, especially as you're a beginning speaker. So, you've got this fantastic talk prepared. Time to take it to humans. Getting to a conference probably costs money. See if your employer has a training budget or a sending people to conferences budget or any other related budget that might cover you. Um, see if the con conference offers scholarships, or compensation, Worst case, if you have to take vacation for it, see if you can't combine it with a bit of a vacation at the destination to get the most out of it. And if you are really stuck for funding to get this fantastic talk to this fantastic conference that you've been accepted to, ask the internet. Say, hey, I'm stuck, I need X amount, what do you recommend? And they can put you in touch with resources or private sponsors that you might have been unaware existed. So it's always worth asking. See if you can work with your employer. There are a bunch of budgets, especially within a larger company, that your conference might be relevant to. And make sure you ask as early as you can. Ask before you apply, hey, what will be available? And ask after you get in, hey, I can come look, make our company look really good at this thing among these people you care about. Um, how, what can you do to help me out? So if you're traveling to a conference, you're going to need some place to stay. Um, if somebody will buy you a hotel, that's great. But if you have to do it on the cheap, you've got a bunch of options these days. Airbnb, couch surfing, um, you can be further out and use public transit. And you can contact locals to the area and see if anyone has a spare room if you need to and if you're comfortable with that. So once you've got your logistics sorted out, your travel to the conference, your housing at the conference, make sure you remember to register. Speakers usually have to register for themselves anyways. Registration will almost always be free for speakers. That's like the bare minimum of speaker perks. There are a small handful of conferences that do charge speakers, so make sure you're aware of that when you're accepting the acceptance. And see if they subsidize travel or hotel for you as well before you book your own. You'll get a badge. You control what goes on the badge. Whatever it is that you put on the badge is what you want people to act on. So um, just put what you want. And I personally really like putting whatever talk slots, the room and time I'll be speaking, onto my badge if the conference doesn't do that for me. Because when I'm in the thick of things, remembering what's going on is like the hard part, one of many hard parts. And then make sure you bring the stuff you're going to need. This sounds obvious, but since I'm doing the complete checklist of everything I know about conferences, I would be remiss to leave it out. 
Bring shoes that you don't mind walking around in for however long the conference is. Bring the clothes you're going to speak in, which I'm going to talk about a bit when I talk about presentation. There are some special considerations. Um, your laptop, your tech gear, your dongles, you've got a bunch of stuff to make the slides come out of your machine and onto their machine. And if you have a clicker or if you want to use a wireless mouse as your clicker, that works too. So make sure when you're at the conference that you take advantage of what it's offering for speakers because they are probably grateful to you for being there and making the conference more successful. They probably have a variety of things for you. They, pro they probably have a speaker dinner. They probably have a speaker lounge, a room that's set aside for you to rehearse your talk in. And they might provide various other things depending on the conf. So learn about the perks, use the perks. And then, so you're there, you're doing the speaker thing. Now you've got to actually speak. This is less difficult than it sounds because you've rehearsed so much already. You wear what you're going to wear. You've already rehearsed in it at least once. Um, Casual is fine, professional is fine too, whatever makes you feel great when you're up on stage. Bear in mind that you will almost certainly be using a clip-on microphone. That means that having something up here to clip the mic to, such as the wonderful polo shirt that LCA has given me, is extremely helpful. And having something in the belt and back pockets area to clip the little clippy deal onto is also very important. This is usually a problem with, um, with some skirts and dresses don't have that, but depends on your outfit, just keep that in mind. Um, shoes you don't mind walking around in, be, uh, bear in mind you might be up on a stage, so people might be looking upward at you. There might be, the camera might be up in a balcony and looking downward on you. Um, so you might be standing behind a large podium. So think about how your outfit will look from all of those angles and make sure that's the way you want to present yourself. So right before your talk, you are a wonderful technologist, but at least all of the wonderful technologists here are occupying human bodies, and so you have to do some basic taking care of a nervous human body things. If you have any medications you need to remember to take, don't forget to take them. If you need a coffee that morning to be your best, drink your coffee. Um, you need blood sugar to be functional and useful. Don't skip a meal to prepare. Never skip a meal to prepare. Um, go to the bathroom beforehand and drink water, have a water bottle on hand. Um, you would be surprised at what the human throat can do when you're nervous. And it's like, oh, I actually want your voice to sound really funny right now. You need a drink of water. I hope you brought one. So you get up to the podium maybe 10 minutes before your talk, and you set yourself up. It is extremely bad luck to present without your laptop plugged into power. Um, your laptop battery will do things that seem to violate the laws of physics if you try it. Um, make sure the video is coming out of your laptop going on to where people will see it. Make sure you've got the various technologies surrounding you, such as the voice amplification system. And make sure that your mic is set up in, in such a way that you can speak in an amplified way throughout the talk. If you're wearing a lapel mic, if you're going to be turning away from the lapel mic, your voice won't be caught as well. If you're using a handheld mic, which I don't have one of right now, you kind of want to talk across the top of the microphone or ask your AV team how you should be holding it and then continue holding it like that throughout the talk. There are fewer tragedies greater than a fantastic talk that didn't get recorded right because the speaker held the mic wrong. And um, I like to take off the conference lanyard because you don't really need a giant flag flailing around in the video as well. So introduce yourself, tell people what they should expect um, how you want questions, whether you want them to tweet at you, where to find your slides later if, you, if they want them. And then do the thing that you practiced. Resist the temptation to speed up. You've done it a bunch of times. You've shown it to an expert. They've approved it. You've made even more improvements on top of that. It's going to be OK. So sometimes you'll lose your slides. And when you lose your slides, I'm cheating because I just did that on purpose. Sorry, AV team, please don't worry too much. Um, it'll kind of feel like a little catastrophe, but it's really not. The audience wants you to succeed. The best thing to do is to just keep going while 
if your slides had really broken, um, the AV team would be scrambling around like a bunch of extremely panicked um, creatures. Fortunately, they're not. They, they saw I did that on purpose. Um, just keep going with your talk and keep, um, keep delivering that content that the audience is there for. Because like, how do you as an audience feel when the speaker's tech has a huge problem? You want them to succeed. You want them to keep going. And finally, the question section of your talk is strictly optional. You do not have to have a Q&A section at all. If you don't want to take questions from the audience right then or ever, no one will make you. So what can you say instead of it's Q&A time? You could say, email me at this address. You could say, please ask me on this or that chat platform. You could say, please ask such and such a mailing list for help with this project. Or you could say, I would only like to take questions about the architecture right now. You can be fine without slides. I'll give you my slides back, though, probably. Um, so finally, it is OK to answer a question with, I don't know. There's this huge stigma around having to say, I don't know. And I don't know where that comes from. Because if you start listening to your mentors, the professionals, the technologists that you really look up to who talk about their tech, they say, I don't know, all the time. They'll say that they don't know particular corners of the project that you happen to be an expert in. And that makes you feel really good. But you can say, if, if you're still a little insecure about saying, I don't know, you can make it a lot better with, but if I came across that problem, here's what I'd do. Or I can introduce you to Jane, who totally knows. So after that, you're pretty much done. You've taken your questions. Um, make sure you get the most out of having given a talk. Brag about it wherever you can. Write it down. Put it on whatever curricula vitae that you happen to share, happen to brag about what you've done. And expect a lot of audience follow-up. Because there's this weird social thing around giving speakers feedback. Most people don't like giving negative feedback to other humans face to face. People who loved your talk will come up to you and say, wow, I loved that talk. It was great. It was really inspiring. People who didn't love your talk usually won't say anything at all. Um, people who didn't love your talk might quietly blame themselves for not having been in quite the right room or not having paid enough attention. But they will, they're very unlikely to actually talk to you. The closest thing you'll usually get to negative feedback is someone might come up to you and say, hey, would you like a piece of feedback? You can say no. You can say, please email me later. Or you can say yes. And they'll say, here's a thing I liked. Here's a thing I think you should improve. Or here's how you could improve something about your talk. And here's another thing I liked. And that, by the way, is an excellent way of presenting um, constructive criticism to speakers is, can I give you some feedback? Would you like some feedback um, rather than just throwing it at them? And the other effect that you'll see as a speaker is that you will get a bunch of new friends. People who don't know very many people at the conference are like, hey, I know you. You talked about that thing. I can come say hi, and we have a conversation topic to share. And so it's an excellent technique for networking as well. So I've got perhaps the most important slide to take a photo of if you don't have my URL already, a giant heap of resources. I am by no means the only person to give advice on how to speak at conferences or why you should. And whenever I see somebody else giving that kind of fantastic advice, I drop it into the readme of the repo where I keep my slides, because I'll be able to find it again when I want it. So you too can find pretty much everything I know of that other people have shared about how to do this speaking thing. And with that, I would love to take questions for our remaining uh, seven minutes. How do you want to handle the mic thing? No, we don't really have a mic, so. Okay, uh, um, we, oh yeah, I'll let you do the yeah, thing first. Right. Um, so yes, uh, please thank Emily, which you've already done, so we can <laughs> pass that one. Um, questions, please, in the form of a question, um, and if you could please repeat them, because we don't have a room. Absolutely. I will repeat questions as we go. White t-shirt. Could you extrapolate on the practice, please? I like, how do you pick which is the family to burden? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Could I extrapolate on the practice? How do you pick which of your family to burden? Well. Um, if someone comes to you looking for attention, you can offer attention in the form of presenting a talk just for them. Small humans, it works on. Uh, make it into a game. 
um, older humans it works on too. And if you have a social network like Twitter and IRC, whatever the cool kids these days are all communicating in groups on, um, ask your group of friends, hey, does anybody want to hang out and listen to my talk? I'll get you coffee. And you'd be surprised at how many people are like, yeah, I would like to feel helpful to you by offering you some criticisms. Um, yeah, back there. That's you. Mm. Yep. Um, so, presenting in this particular space, you often encounter um, a lot of individuals and a lot of topics that people get very, very passionate about. And that passion can sometimes show through in question time with certain individuals who wish to heckle the speaker following the talk. As a speaker, how do you, uh, or what advice would you have for potential speakers to deal with those circumstances? Yes, I so the. Ah, yes. Yes. The question is, um, especially in spaces like this, people are very passionate. And that can sometimes come across a bit like heckling to the speakers. How do you advise a speaker to deal with that kind of heckling? So the way I personally deal with it is I do a thing that my brain is going to do anyways because it's worried. And I try to anticipate um, what could go wrong. What are people going to say? about this. What might they ask me? And when I'm rehearsing for an expert, I also ask them, hey, if you were going to like ask me really hard questions, what kind of really hard questions would you ask about this talk? And so I think ideally you rehearse for someone with the kind of opinions that would make them heckle you. And then depending on what your answers to that commentary is, like you can have weeks to think about those answers. And there's a, a French term, which I would butcher if I tried to pronounce it, translates to spirit of the staircase, where you realize the witty retort after the chance for it is gone. But if you can make that chance for the witty retort happen way before your talk, then you can have it in your pocket when you're actually up on stage. So I would say anticipating the heckling questions if you plan on taking questions is the way to go. Otherwise, take the questions out of band in a situation where you have a lot more control about when and how you reply. Um, question there? Do you have any advice for potential speakers, but also maybe potential victims of uh, um, test talks? Um, if the person who is giving feedback is so enthusiastic, they talk for an hour about all the things that could be done better, and the speaker then suddenly thinks, oh my god, my talk is really terrible and I shouldn't ever have embarked on this. OK, the question is, what happens when you test your talk on someone and they give you so many little criticisms that it makes you think, oh man, I shouldn't have ever done that. So the first way to address this is kind of bounding the kind of criticism you want. Say, do you have any feedback on the order I have the topics? Do you have any feedback on the way I talk? And if you have someone you anticipate will give the, if I were giving this talk, I would do everything differently kind of feedback. You can, well, one thing you can do is prompt them to give the talk. Um, another thing you can do is, yeah, just ask for the specific feedback on the things you think you should improve. And if they just really want to talk to you, and that's why they're giving you this hour of feedback, I would say pull out your notebook. Start taking notes on what they're saying and try to boil it down into like the top two things you think they'd want you to change. And go, so what I'm hearing is that you think I should speak slower and put this section before that one. And they go, yeah, that's great, blah, 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 blah. And now you have the like core distilled feedback. And you can also balance that out by giving your talk to someone who's just not going to be particularly critical and just be a huge cheerleader for you right after that. Like, I find often that non-technical family members are just like, oh, it's so cool that you're talking. I know what some of those words mean. You're doing great. So to balance that out. And do I have time for one more? I have more. two minutes. So yes. Uh, yeah, just a, a purely presentational question. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That, so how do you cope when you get the double echo around the room with the, um, I've had that happen occasionally. It is awful. During AV checks, I make sure to point it out to the wonderful AV people, ask them if there's anything they can do to fix it. Um, sometimes they can turn your volume down a bit so it's not quite as conspicuous, but sometimes you're just stuck with it. And when I'm personally speaking in a room that's that bad, I like to, well, I fall back 
onto the sound bites that I've memorized as I was talking through it. I'm not as spontaneous or extemporaneous about what I'm saying because I need to have the end of the sentence fully planned, otherwise I'm going to get distracted by myself being at the start while I'm in the middle. Um, it's, it's bad. It, you can, I always make sure to mention it when I'm presenting as well. Oh, wow, there's quite the echo in here. I'm gonna, I apologize if I get off task a bit, although apologizing is not the way to go. Don't, don't apologize. Just, wow, there's a bit of an echo. This might be a bit distracting as we go through. And pause more often to collect your thoughts. Just plan your sentence all the way through. Deliver the sentence all the way through. Don't listen to the feedback. And it's tough, but you can make it through. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, those of you who sat in the middle get the little um, you can speak at tech conferences zine that I drew that kind of summarizes all of this onto a sheet of A4, um, tiny book. Feel free to grab one on your way out. Grab some for your friends. Our wonderful organizers printed us um, like 100 of them. And thank you very much for attending my talk. And I hope that everybody learned something. Thanks again, <laughs> Emily.